Good morning. This webinar offers closed captioning. To enable closed captioning, click on the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred method. Welcome to the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection webinar. Please note any website or email that I mentioned will be posted in the chat box. For those seeking business licensing assistance, you can visit the Small Business Center at City Hall or call 312-74-GO-BIZ. Also, business licenses can be applied for or renewed online at chicago.gov slash business licensing. If you are part of the BACP Entrepreneur Certificate Program, you can get credit for joining this webinar. Or if you want to learn about the program, please visit chicago.gov slash BACP Certificate. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available at youtube.com slash Chicago BACP. I will post the mentioned information in the chat box. We encourage attendees to ask questions. Please use the chat box to send your questions. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please note that the views, information, and opinions expressed during this webinar are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent the official policies or position of the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection or the City of Chicago. Today's <laughs> webinar will be How to Write a Business Plan, What You Need to Know, presented by Donna Rockin, Managing Partner of Rockin Enterprises. Donna? There, now I'm unmuted, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, it's a pleasure to be here, Geraldine. Thank you so much for inviting me. And good morning to everybody who's uh, dialed in to hear this presentation. We're gonna talk about writing a business plan. And it's important, even though you typically need one, oftentimes to get a lease, like a landlord wants to see that you're a legitimate business and definitely your banker, to, before it gives you any money, uh, any kind of business loan. It's important to know that it is your roadmap to success and you should revisit it every 12 to 18 months because sometimes you think you know what your business is. It's the business plan you wrote, it's your heart's content. And then all of a sudden you do well, but your customers start asking you for another good or service. And then you realize the real cash cow is the other service. Like you might be a landscaping business, but then people all ask you, can you also uh, do outdoor decorations for their businesses for holidays or for, you know, to make their properties festive to get people to walk into their stores. And so all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, the real money is in outdoor decorating and not so much in the mowing and the shoveling. So that's why you should revisit it because very often your business changes. So, and now I'm doing a uh, page. That, that was the one thing we didn't check, Geraldine, was how to, oh, I guess I'll just do it with the thumb wheel because the other thing isn't working. All right. So. Um, I manage a partner. I've been around since 1988. There is all my contact information at the end of the um, program. Oh, maybe if I do this, ta-da. Okay, we figured that out. Uh, so a business plan is a written document and it clearly defines the goals of a startup or existing business. So a lot of times you have to redo your business plan too if you go and decide, well, now I need money or now I'm expanding, or I'm going to go open up in another suburb or another part of Chicago. So a lot of times you have to redo your uh, business plan, but you should update it for yourself too, because it, it gives you a realistic check-in of where you are at this point in time. And it also outlines specific methods for achieving your goals. So here's what's included in a business plan. Your executive summary your business description, your product or service description. And when I say product or service, they're interchangeable, whether you're a service business or you're actually selling things. Your marketing plan, your operations and management plan, and very, very important, and this is where people get in trouble, is the financial plan. So even though your executive summary comes first, 
in your business plan. You know, you're all going to be using Word or some word processing uh, program, similar program. You write it last. It comes first in the series of documents that goes in your business plan. But if you write it at the end, when you've answered all these questions and the um, there's a handout that I've given Geraldine that she'll post, it you answer the questions in complete sentences and you wind up with a business plan. So just answer all the other questions in, com uh, in complete sentences and thoughts, and then write your business plan, your summary at the very end and just put it in the beginning. So what is an executive summary? It's a few paragraphs. It's a page, a page and a half. It's short. It's brief. It includes your product service description, your target market description, your overall goals and objectives for your business. And oftentimes to your qualifications, like I've been a lawyer at a big law firm for 15 years, and now I want to hang up my own shingle. Okay, so the business description, describe the business in detail. You include the uh, business name and location. And if you don't have an address yet, you can, um, I think we skipped one. Nope, maybe not. If you don't have an address yet, you can include, you know, just the part of Chicagoland that you want to open up or the part of the suburbs. You know, this is a Chicago business that will open up in Bucktown or will open up in uh, West Ridge or West, you know, um, Rogers Park or Lincoln Park. Um, describe the legal structure of your business. What is the um, are you an LLC? Are you a subchapter S? Are you a sole proprietor? Are you a simple partnership? And you really need to work with your lawyer to help you decide what's your best legal structure and your accountant, because it depends on how wealthy you are in the unlikely event you do get sued. If you're a sole proprietor and you have a lot of private wealth or your um, partner does and you know, you're in a legal um partnership or you have a spouse that you're legally wed to and they have a lot of assets you want to make sure that they can't come after your personal assets so you really need to talk to your accountant and your lawyer before you choose a business structure and you can choose a business structure to start out with and change it you know if you make a mistake if you start start out as a sole proprietor while you're getting all your everything in order and you know seeing if you have a sustainable business and then when it really takes off you can switch to a c corp or a uh, subchapter s or an llc you just can't change every year because that's a red flag for the irs but if you make a mistake and choose the wrong structure you can change it just not frequently describe what makes your business unique what is your unique selling proposition? What disruptive technology are you using? And sometimes what makes you unique is just you're the only one in the neighborhood. There is no florist in the new part of wherever they develop, where they took down Children's Memorial and now they put up that, that's a beautiful area that they've developed there. But maybe there's no florist in the neighborhood or maybe there's no, um, electronic store, or there's no something else there. There's no dry cleaner. People who were going to the hospital didn't need a dry cleaner. So there may not be a dry cleaner in the neighborhood that you can walk to. So it doesn't matter that you, there might be 3000 dry cleaners in Chicago land. If there's none in that neighborhood, that can make it unique. And also describe why your business will succeed. Um, in your product service description, what is your product or service? Summarize any key technology or concept or strategy that your business is based on. Think of um, the, the ring, you know, security systems or the Apple AirTag or the tile mate that you affix to your phone or your keys so that you can find them. Is there technology? that makes your business really unique. 
think of now how many things you can do with a smartphone that you used to need a fob for to get into some place or even the parking apps that all knew that all use um, QR codes. So what features and benefits does your product or service have? And like I said, a lot of times the benefit is that you're in the neighborhood and nobody else is. You're a wine store. You sell wines less than $15 a bottle. The dry cleaner we mentioned, daycare. There is not enough daycare in uh, Chicagoland or uh, pet boarding or doggy daycare. So, you know, a lot of times it isn't rocket science. There's no big um, key technology. It's just that you are new to the neighborhood and none exists. How does your product or service solve your uh, customer's needs uniquely? And that's what we're talking about, a unique selling proposition. What is uh, unique about your business? And one of the things that uh, we didn't mention yet, but I do want to mention, there is a booklet and it's called the, um, a book, it's called The Business Model Generation business model generation. And I sent Geraldine, this is a, you know, a trademark copyright book. I sent her the handout for it because the handout is posted widely on the web that I'm not stealing anything. And it's called the business model canvas. And it helps organize your thoughts before you even write the business plan. The book is by Alexander Osterwilder and it's O-S-T-E-R. W-A-L-D-E-R, Alexander Osterwalder. And it's the business model uh, generation. Do not buy the ebook because when you buy the ebook, the first sentence is this book is better as a book. And it is. I made the mistake because I bought the book, a digital book, loaded it on my uh, laptop, got on a plane, booted up the, when they said it's safe and it's the first sentence says this book is better as a book but you might want to do it to help you organize your thoughts before you because it's separated into nine sections about who's your customer who are your um, suppliers what's unique about your business so you might find it very helpful to use that as your precursor to your business plan and describe why a customer would buy from you I don't know how many of you have shopped at ABT, the electronics store. It's out in Glenview. I think they sell more electronics and home goods per capita square, rather per square foot than any other place in America. And they have one store, but their service is stupendous. So sometimes just having better customer service, it's not that you buy the lowest price product, but they stand behind it when things go south. So that can be your unique selling proposition. Define in detail your target market. And I always wanted to throw people, I used to run entrepreneurship centers and I always wanted to throw them out of the office when they would say, oh, everybody's my customer. No, everybody isn't your customer. You wanna go after and chase your primary target audience, which is you know, your heaviest users and your second uh, target market is the next heaviest users. So yes, if you make a product, somebody in high school might buy it. They might buy it as a gift for mom or dad or whatever, but your heaviest users might be women 18 to 25 if it's cosmetics. And then the second heaviest users are 26 to 40. And the next group would be unless you have skincare for old women, which I can understand perfectly. If you can see me, you can tell the gray hair is real. It's not blonde. Um, might be, you know, 41 to 60, you know, when you start worrying if your skin is going south. So you have to define really your target audience and who is your heaviest user. Also your direct competitors, think Coke versus Pepsi. That's a direct competitor to Coke. A cola is Pepsi Cola, but there's other indirect or alternative um, competitors. 
think milk, juice, water, all those sports drinks, um, Gatorade, Red Bull. I mean, there's a lot of things. You used to drink a Coca-Cola with caffeine in it if you wanted a buzz. Now there's a million energy and protein and uh, super, I mean, um, Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew has super caffeinated Mountain Dew as if the original isn't a big enough caffeine boost. So think about who your indirect and alternative uh, competitors are as well. And then what's the positioning of your product? Is it uh, good, better, or best? Are you the Chevy? Are you the Cadillac? Or are you you know, the BMW, where are you? Good, better, best. And I also want to point out that I gave Geraldine a competitive analysis in the handout so you can find them when she posts everything or she'll send them to you after the lecture. But the competitive analysis has um, slots for your company in the left-hand corner and then uh, four or five competitors underneath you. And then across the x-axis horizontally, you can list features on which you compete. And it could be price, location, the fact that you have multiple ways to pay for your product, you know, 36 months, same as uh, cash, no interest, you know, so you can decide convenient parking and parking in the city can be a real plus that, you know, your competitor might not have and you have to pay city hall to park your car versus one of those strip malls where there is uh, free parking. So what is the positioning of your product and what competitive features do you have? <coughs> so define the product packaging when you're doing your marketing plan. Where are you the package? And sometimes if you're the real estate agent, you are the package. If you've ever bought a condo or a single family home or a townhouse, when they usually show up to take you to tour different locations, even some of them that do rental, they come, they're dressed to the nines. They pick you up in their car. They're going to show you around. They have an impeccably clean and nice modern car because they want to convey to you as soon as you see them, they are the most competent real estate agent in the area and they are gonna find you your dream home. Just look at how well they're dressed. They just wanna reek of success when, as soon as you see them. So sometimes you are the package. Think about how um, Best Buy makes all the employees wear blue shirts or Target makes everybody wear a, run, a red shirt so that you can easily identify people that can help you in the store. And a lot of times, um, the packaging itself really enhances the product's use. Think of Dean's Milk Chug. Dean Revolution, Dean is a Chicago company. They have been bought out by somebody else uh, not too long ago, but Dean's revolutionized the milk industry by getting rid of little wax boxes and putting milk in a cylindrical container similar to a bottle of um, pop or a can of Coke because it would fit the cup holder in a car or an SUV. And mom could give her kids milk as she was shuttling them to basketball practice or baseball practice or dance instead of giving them a can of pop or juice. And it revolutionized milk products because they used to always come in a wax container Similar to some products still come um, super duper whipped cream, ultra pasteurized whipped cream comes in a, a little um, wax coated box. And, but all milk products, small milk products, not big ones, not quarts or gallons or half gallons, but small milk products used to come in those little wax cartons and they revolutionized the business. So the packaging, think of Campbell's cup of soup or Tide Pods, and now there's dishwashing pods, as if pouring the dishwashing crystals was too complicated into the little mechanism. Um, 
think of mac and cheese cups or ramen cups. Think of how many uh, packages really improve the usefulness of your product. So that might be what's your unique selling proposition that you're the first one to make it in, you know, packages that are shelf stable or et cetera, or you have a longer use by date because it's ultra pasteurized. Where will your business be located? And is the right location critical? Are you home-based? And you might be. If you always go to your clients, you can easily be home-based and nobody has to know. If you have to meet them, say, oh, I'm going to be near your business. Let's meet at the your office or the Starbucks. Hotel lobbies are good places to meet people. I will say if you are a home-based business and you live in a single family home or a town home somewhere where you are on the first floor and you don't want, you know, um, you don't want your customers to contact you at your house or know where you live. It's not advised, especially if you're a women-owned business and you live alone. I don't recommend you advertising your home address. E even if you're a seamstress, you go to the client and you figure out how to adjust their hem or take, you know, shorten the sleeves. You can get a mailbox with an address at a UPS store. I don't know how much it costs, but it's well worth your safety to do that because you look like a legitimate business because you'll have a street address and your PO box is your suite number, but it's the UPS store. It's not your single family home and you're home alone all day. Um, and so oftentimes the, where the business is located is not important. However, many times it is really important. So if you can see on this slide, the little red A, that's a Dunkin' Donuts. And in front of it is a BP station. If you really look at the slide, you can see it. And it said Eola is the vertical street and the horizontal street is North Aurora Road. <clears throat> it's one of the busiest, star, uh, rather busiest Dunkin' Donuts because it has convenient parking and you can easily get to it from either street, the horizontal or the vertical street. Okay, so that's the good news. That's the Dunkin' Donuts where the little green arrow is. This, however, where this A is, was a terrible choice for a store. It was a retail store, not a wholesale store. And it was on the back side of an industrial park. There's no way you could see any signage at all, none. And so the business quickly failed. And so never let a real estate agent pressuring into, oh, I have six people looking at this property. You better take it soon. You know, don't be pressured into it. There's always another location. And you don't want to be in a location that's difficult for your customers to find. To that point, if the city limits of uh, you know the city regulations allow you should have signage that's horizontal on the front of your store and also hangs out vertically so you can see it walking down the street or driving down the street you want to make it as easy as possible for customers to find your store so if they allow vertical signs in some areas do some strip malls do you know, check with your alderman. They'll know all the rules and regulations for what signage is. And in fact, your alderman often has to approve your signage unless you're in a strip mall that already has serious um, rules about what your signage is or in an inside mall. Uh, check with your alderman. But it's very important that people can easily find your business. So location, location, like I said, if you always go to the customer, doesn't make a bit of difference. But if they have to find you, location is incredibly important. By the way, um, there are commercial real estate agents that are different than ones that find you private housing or living uh, real estate agents. They specialize in commercial property. And you also have to understand, this is important, before we leave this topic, um, because my clients learned it the hard way, when you sign a commercial lease, 
if it's in the lease, you get it. And if it's not in the lease, you don't get it. And what a lot of new entrepreneurs don't understand when they're opening up a storefront is that the landlord gives you the property as is, unless you spell out that they'll put in new tile or they'll paint the walls or they'll take out the fixtures. You know, you really have to spell it out or it has working air conditioning or heating or whatever. So make sure a real estate attorney looks at that lease and you've read it several times and you understand exactly what you're getting. To that point, if you can convince the landlord to do the build out and charge you more rent, you can save a boatload of money in the long run. And I'll tell you how that works. So there's a a small storefront and the rent is going to be $1,500 a month and it includes um, nothing. But the landlord can pay for the painting and getting new carpeting or tile in there and some simple fixtures, whatever, and he'll charge you $1,800 a month. It is better to pay the $1,800 a month because the $1,800 a month is tax deductible as rent. It's fully tax deductible as a business expense. If you have to pay for the build out, you have to amortize it over 27 and a half years. And you don't know if you're gonna stay in that location 27 and a half years. If your business takes off, you might have to move to a bigger storefront. You might move to a different area. So, you know, if an amortization is like is a fancy word for depreciation, you can only depreciate the build out that you pay. So if it's a you know fifty thousand dollars, you take one twenty seventh and a half off every year from your income taxes, your business income taxes. So it's not such a great deal. So get a good real estate uh, attorney. How will you price your product or service? We did. Um, mentioned briefly, will you be, uh, you know, good, better, best? Will you be lower than your competition, on par with your competition, or higher than your competition? And think about fast food restaurants. They're pretty much on par with their competition. You know, maybe they have a special, you know, the McDonald's drinks for a dollar or whatever, but they're pretty much on par because you don't want to be the lowest one and you could be the lowest one for some particular small service like the soda pop because they're only paying for the syrup. The charged water is minuscule, you know, and the cup, the cup probably costs more than the Coke itself. So you can have some loss leaders, but you pretty much want to be on par with the competition or higher than the competition. If you want to be the lowest guy in town, You can easily go out of business because you cut your price and your competitor across the street cuts his price. Then you cut your price again. It's not a winning proposition. So I strongly recommend against it. Although like the grocery stores, when they give away a gallon of milk, if you buy three boxes of cereal, you know, you can't have a lost leader. You just can't give away the whole business. How does your price compare to direct and indirect competitors? You know, will they buy? Your coffee, if you have an independent cafe versus a Starbucks, you know, are your baked goods, you know, maybe your coffee's on par with Starbucks, but your baked goods are less expensive. So think about it if you, how you compare to your direct and indirect competitors. And can you, uh, and, and also if you can't compete against Hostess, you know, as an indirect competitor for baked goods, can you be profitable? Because um, going back to the Hostess, if you're at a 7-Eleven and you get coffee and a hostess, uh, I don't know, hand pie or cupcake or Twinkie, you know, and you're right next door to a 7-Eleven, you have to think about how they price their coffee. And can you be profitable at your chosen um, price? And to that point, sometimes you can be very profitable even at free. 
And think about free apps. Think about how many ads you watch on YouTube paid for by advertisers so that YouTube is free. Or think about Google, that when you Google, you know, something, um, Mexican restaurant in my neighbor, you know, in, in zip code 60605, and some Mexican restaurant shows up, you know, the advertiser, the Mexican restaurant is paying so Google is free to you. So think about um, how you're going to price your product. And sometimes you have to be profitable, but you can be profitable even at free. How will you promote or advertise your business? Um, you know, are you going to use mass media? Mass media is TV, billboards, and national magazines. Or are you going to use local media? And local media can still be billboards, but they're billboards just in a specific neighborhood or direct mail or local radio. Think about, um, we all know WeatherTech, the story of WeatherTech. They're out in Bolingbrook. But they achieved their success just through billboards on highways in rush hour when you're stopped and you read the billboard because you're bored to tears and by advertising on radio stations that were predominantly news stations because you get, they gave you the traffic and the weather um, on the eights like WBBM and WeatherTech sort of made their whole marketing campaign about you know, is your car slushy and dirty because you're driving in a snowstorm in Chicago today? So targeted media can be very, very um, successful, and it's way more cost efficient, especially for the new smaller startup than mass media. Um, think of Google AdWords. Google and they'll and Google AdWords gives you training. Oh, um, they changed the name, but I want to say it's Google My Business where they Google will give you a, you know, that um, block that shows up when you know where you're going and you go to um, Rocky's lunch. It was my father, may he rest in peace, former restaurant. But if he would have gotten Google my business and he would put in Rocky's lunch, they tell you the address of the business, the location of the business, the hours it's open and some of the restaurants, even they tell you like when they're peak, you know, when they're too busy to go to, and that's free from Google. So get it, you know, you have to verify that you're a legitimate business, but by all means, and if it's not called Google My Business, it, they might've changed the name slightly, but do look it up. So there's, and Google AdWords is a bidding competition. So you can say when people advertise, um, blind stores in my neighborhood and somebody comes up and they're the first racking one, you know, you put in your zip code or they, or Google knows where you live. When you come up first in a Google search, that's a paid for search position and you can set the market price. So you can say, I'll pay 50 cents to be the first Google search till I reach $5 every day. But your competitor Hunter, you know, you might be uh, Mr. Brown's blind store, but Hunter Douglas might be saying, I'll pay 75 cents in the bidding competition up to $10 to be the first one in the Google search. So that's how Google AdWords works. But there's e-newsletters and you can try e-newsletters for first for free. I know Constant Contact gives you uh, a sample that you can have 50 newsletters, 50 registrants receive your newsletter for free so as a trial so that you can see if it works and there's also MailChimp I don't know what the freebie is for MailChimp but it's probably similar there's Facebook Lou Malnati's has been so Lou Malnati's our Chicago hero has been so successful with their Facebook page that they only advertise for uh, jobs that are open on their Facebook page because they have such a devout following and they feel that people who follow them and believe in their mission and their values are part of their Facebook community, that they found they got much better applicants when they only, and it's free for them to advertise looking for two waitresses or a bus boy or a bus girl. That's 
be, you know, or a cashier. So um, you might look at free ways or nearly free ways to advertise your company. You, in your marketing plan, you have to answer your physical distribution questions. Where will your uh, customers expect to find your product or service? And if you think about, I think you are never more than 300 yards away from a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi. Because you can find them anywhere. They're in the front of the store in the checkout lines. like getting, you know, a Pepsi where the soda pop was in the back of the store in the beverage aisle was too far away, but they want to sell you a cold one if you're tired from shopping. So, or candy. Think of how there's all those candy bars and gum, Wrigley, Hershey in the checkout counter. You want to be in all the magazines because people are bored and they tend to read a story and then they don't finish it by the time their turn to check out. So they buy the magazine. So you want to be where your customers expect to find you, where they're looking at your competition. And you also have to think of how you're going to get your uh, products distributed. Will you use wholesale wholesalers? Will you use sales reps? Wholesalers, especially if you make food products, you often sell to a wholesaler or medical devices you sell to a wholesaler and then they do the last delivery to the grocery store or the quick mart or the 7-Eleven or even the restaurant. Think about how restaurants buy their food. They buy them from wholesalers. So um, when you see those, um, and then we stock the shelves. I, I've heard this story, I assume it's true because the guy was very reputable, that Walmart, because they have such power in their purchasing power when they buy from a um, manufacturer, normally overpacks of food that go into grocery stores come in units of 24, 36, some multiple of 12, because it's just the way that it's you know, they used to give you a baker's dozen, which is 12 plus one as a bonus during certain buying periods. But instead of getting 24 or 36 ketchups, they made Heinz make a special package just for Walmart stores that held 30 bottles of ketchup because it was the most, that was how their products turned. They knew that they sold. 30 bottles of ketchup every 10 days or whatever. And that was how they wanted the case pack. So, but they bought their ketchup. You know, they bought directly from Heinz, but oftentimes you buy from a wholesaler. And then uh, very important, have multiple suppliers. If you make a product that counts on uh, different components to make it, if you're making you know, grandma's jelly, or you're making, you know, that has ingredients, it has pectin, it has fruit, it has jars, it has lids, it has labels. You have multiple suppliers because we really noticed it, especially, and they did not take this lecture, during COVID, when so many American companies depended on only one supplier to give them uh, components for their product or overseas, worse, overseas vendors to give them components for their products and everything shut down. Where if you have multiple suppliers, especially when you're a startup local suppliers, it's much easier for you not to have to shut down because you can't get a component. So I strongly uh, recommend. The other way you can also sell your products and services, and this is very important, especially to startups, is on Amazon or Etsy or your own website direct to consumer. But a lot of companies, especially when they make new products, new shampoos, new um, cosmetics, new something, you know, they start on very limited and they do it through 
uh, Amazon, they get an Amazon store, because then when they want to be in real stores, they can go to people like the Walmart and the Targets, et cetera, and say, we sell 10,000 units a month just by people who find us on Amazon. And so we know that if we can now say also available at Target or Walmart, you know, your sales will only increase on our website. So you can start selling products and it can be a very, you know, because a lot of times new real retailers don't want to take you because they think you, they're not going to have the turns. Why give you real estate on the shelf if you're not going to move your products? So think about that as a method to get some traction. Resource requirements, technology. What are you going to do for your equipment, your software, your internet connectivity? How much is it gonna cost you? Are you gonna need tablets for all of your salespeople? A lot of restaurants now, fast casual restaurants, have their waiters and waitresses take the order on, iPads or similar. So, you know, and a lot of times now, which in Europe, they've done it for decades, they bring you that little machine where you run your credit card through at the table uh, to pay your bill. So think about what kind of software and hardware you're going to need. Your personnel requirements, part-time, uh, full-time, contract. Are you going to do bot background checks, bonding? When is someone and really a contractor, and it's called the 1099 test. And you can Google the IRS 1099 test because the Department of Labor can come out of you and really take a lot of your money if you hire people as contractors, which means they're independent uh, employ you know, workers. Independent workers usually mean like an accountant, a lawyer, a bookkeeper, you know, somebody who comes once or twice a week and looks at your books or somebody, you know, who um, the housekeeping, you know, the cleaning service that you hire to mop the floors at night and, you know, empty the garbage cans at your business. Those are independent contractors, but the 1099 test explains, do you have control over their behavior? Their um, finances, like do you set their price, how much you're going to pay them, or do they set their pricing, the type of relationship they have, and the key aspect of the work they do for you. So if it's intermittent, like you hire the lawn care service to come in and do the gardening and the snow removal in front of your storefront, they're an independent contractor. But if you have one of your employees and you say, in addition to uh, being a retail clerk, you're also going to shovel the snow, et cetera. You can't pay them separately <clears throat> as an independent contractor because they really work for you and you control what they wear, when they do it, how they do it. So before you tell the government they're a 1099, make sure you look at the IRS 1099 test. Resource, oh, the other thing is, if you have children, especially if they're over the working age, you know, 16 or older, and you need help with your computer, your website, your order, you know, et cetera, you can hire your kids and pay them a salary instead of an allowance. And it's totally legal. So think about, you know, what they can do. And if you get, there's the age for children that work for you that are related to you is, I believe it's less, you have to check in Illinois, than 16, they can do like small part-time gigs if they're your direct relatives, but definitely if they're 16 and older. And like I said, allowance is not deductible. Part-time employment is deductible. Resource requirements, what other resources does the business need? You need a website, printed materials, leave behinds, takeaway. Even car companies now, car companies have no takeaways. You used to take away those expensive booklets or sheets about the different colors. But my husband and I went to a Ford dealer and we were shocked. Everything is online. There's no takeaways anymore. But you might need 
business cards as lead behinds or magnets. If you are a repairman, if you are the handyman repairman who repairs refrigerators, ovens, wash machines, dryers, you want to get a magnet with your name and uh, number and email address and cell phone number so that customers can quickly find you when, yes, you successfully fix their stove, but now their dryer's on the fit fritz, you know, and most people, if they put a magnet up, it does not come down. Um, and that would be considered a leave behind. Do you need a uh, physical office or business space? And then external requirements. Do you need an accountant, a lawyer, a cleaning service for the business? You know, uh, an insurance agent. And I strongly recommend you get a strong, um, trusted insurance agent. And the way you find these, if you are a new business and you need an accountant, a lawyer, a cleaning service, ask other small non-competing businesses in the area. So if you're going to open up in Bucktown and you're going to be the wine store, Ask the dry cleaner who they use for their accountant and lawyer and cleaning service or insurance agent. Ask the, you know, independent coffee shop. Ask the mechanic in the neighborhood because you want to get a personal reference from, you know, other small business owners. So that's a good way to find a trusted uh, independent contractor. Other resource requirements you might want to think about is cloud computing, Microsoft Office, especially their cloud 365, because it's constantly updated and your accountant might want all your books, you know, where it's constantly updated. QuickBooks or something similar. Grasshopper, and they have other services like them too, is one where they a, a customer calls your office and you're not there and it, then it looks for you on your cell phone and if you're not there it looks for you at your house phone but the customer doesn't know it's being forwarded they just hear ringing to different locations so that's a phone forwarding service there's Regis offices there's also WeWork offices there's 1871 in the merchandise mark these are shared office spaces and and we work in 1871 and Regis are just a few of the shared office spaces here in Chicagoland. Do you need iPads or smartphones? Do you need a website? You know, do you need GoDaddy or Namecheap? You may not, like I said, if you're selling, um, you know, tacos to go, you might, you might need a Google My Business that just says your name and your address and where you are and the hours of operation but you might not necessarily need a full website showing your menu, et cetera, till you're big enough to start using your own delivery people or DoorDash. And, um, and then uh, do you need Vistaprint? Vistaprint is just a very cost efficient, and I don't own stock in any of these people. I don't own stock in the UPS store. I don't own stock in GoDaddy, Namecheap, Vistaprint. But uh, Vistaprint is a small business owner who thought it was too expensive to get business cards and stationery and envelopes and invoices. So he started his own business. I've heard him speak. He's, he's brilliant. And what Vistaprint does is it does gang printing. So when you order business cards, they're not setting up the press just to print your business cards. They're printing 48 on a sheet and then cutting them. So you get 500, the dog groomer gets 500, you know, so it's very cost efficient, but I do not own stock in it. And that is Google My Business, which is free to uh, small businesses we've already talked about. Um, so who will be in charge of your business? You know, do you have a business partner? Are you going to be um, Mr. or Miss? outdoor salesman and somebody else takes, you know, in charge of the business, or are you going to be a silent partner and really back somebody else to run the day-to-day -day operation? But that has to be mentioned in your operations and management plan. And what special qualifications or expertise do you have? And sometimes it's that it was a hobby. I was a little league coach for 20 years till my kids all grew up or whatever. And now I'm going to open up a baseball camp in my retirement. 
and teach kids how to, you know, play baseball in the, during summer break and spring break, et cetera. So sometimes it can be a ha hobby. Um, when do you need employees? Do you know the laws for interviewing employees? You hit, familiarize yourself with Title VII, the Equal Opportunity Employment Act. And because you can't ask about age or sex or sexual orientation or any genetic information or birthplace or count, you know, country of origin or citizenship or disabilities or, um, you know, gender, if they, even if you can clearly tell that somebody is cross-dressing and appears as a different gender that you believe their born gender is, you cannot ask. And it really isn't important, you know, to your job. So don't ask, stay on the good side of the law. You can't ask marital status or pregnancy status. Um, you can't ask anything about race or an eth ethnicity or religion unless it is germane to the job. Like people interviewing, if you interview somebody, I don't know if you do, but if a synagogue interviews people to be a rabbi, you can see if they're really Jewish and they're ordained rabbis or ordained priests. But other than a very small area, you really can't ask um, religious denomination. You can't ask about home ownership bankruptcy or wage garnishment. And you can't ask former um, salary history. It's illegal in Illinois. And I think they're making it illegal in more and more states because it perpetuates women and minorities earning lower wages than um, their male counterparts. So you really can't ask wage history in Illinois anymore. But um, and you can't check credit scores unless there is a few, you have to Google it and ask your accountant. There are a few legal reasons why you can check a credit score, but most of it has to do with that you're entrusting the employees to take cash. So if you have a cash-based business, you know, a restaurant, now most restaurants even take credit cards or Apple Pay or Samsung Pay. But if they handle cash or petty cash, if it's a small, you know, real estate company and the secretary or the office manager handles, you know, $500 in petty cash, if they handle cash, you can um, check credit scores, but the, it's very, very narrow to see if you can check credit. Whoops. Um, what salaries will you pay? And so that's important because you can't ask prior history. So you really have to decide what the market is paying or how much it's going to take you to get people. A lot of people in Chicagoland are paying much more than the minimum wage. I believe it's, I believe it's $16 in Chicagoland. It might be more now. I haven't checked recently. Oh, a lot of times it goes up July 1 and I didn't check. So I don't know if it's changed. But I know at Menards, they had signed up that starting pay was $19.60, which I know is way more than any minimum pay. And it promised you a raise in six months of another 80 cents. So, you know, you have to pay what it takes to get workers in this tight um, economy. What training will you require your employees to have or what skills do they really need to have and a lot of people believe it is better to take employees with um good attitudes and um teach them what they need to know versus taking somebody who has a lot of specific experience in an area now obviously not doctors or mechanics something where you really need a skilled trainer but especially for us office workers you're better if they have good attitudes and they look like they'll fit in with the team than any specific skill and can you uh will you give drug tests or do background checks or bond employees and think about this is mostly bonding employees is if um and background checks is if your employees go into other people's homes 
if, if you have a carpet cleaning business and they're going into somebody else's home, you want to make sure they don't steal grandma's china or silverware. Um, who will manage the business's day-to-day finances. Are you going to do it? Are you going to have a bookkeeper? Is your spouse going to do it on the weekends? How will you process and record sales? Are you going to use software? Do you have a POS system? A point to sale system. Those are special registers where every time you like there were point of sale is used in all the fast food joints so that every time they sell a double cheeseburger or a single cheeseburger or a plain burger or a Coke, they just, you know, press the button and it keeps track of exactly what they're selling and relieves inventory. Does your business have any special or local federal, um, federal regulations? Now think about this. If we were live, I would ask you the trick question. When do you charge sales tax in Illinois? And the correct answer would be is when you sell a product. Because right now, when you sell services, you don't charge. They want to change it because they make money. But when you sell um, a service, you don't pay any sales tax on the services. So when you go to the dentist, you don't pay any sales tax on cleaning your teeth. When you go to the car mechanic, and he puts in a new battery, you don't pay sales tax on the labor to install the battery, but you do pay sales tax on the battery itself because the battery is a product. Um, also other federal, federal regulations that you'd have to worry about is if you were a mechanic getting rid of spent motor oil, there's a you know an EPA way to get rid of it uh, for collection and recycling. If you do asbestos removal, how to get rid of it once your guys in you know hazmat suits take it out. So um, if you're a contractor pulling business of uh, pulling building permits, so that you know you do not need a building permit. Say you're a home remodeler and you're just changing a toilet, but the toilet's going in exactly where the old toilet was and you're not doing anything else. You don't, and I'm not a building person, so check with BACP to find out the real laws and the real rules. But in general, you don't need to pull a permit if you're doing something minor and it's and it's going in the exact same place. But if you are renovating a whole house and you're doing lots of work or you're renovating the whole bathroom and you're moving where the toilet was, or you're moving where the tub was, you're separating the tub from the shower, and it's major work, you need a building permit. So know your local and federal rules. Um, if other rules, if you, um, depending on what you do, you might do what's called a project proposal or a request for a project proposal if you do government contracts. And you'd be surprised there are small business development centers throughout the city. They're free to go to. Some charge nominal fees for classes, but it's a department. It's a, called small business development centers. And then there's another group called the um, procurement technical assistance centers. Some are, they're both in the same place. Some are separated, but procurement technical assistance centers help you sell to government agencies because you have to do requests for proposal and they can be very daunting, but you'd be surprised what the government buys. Don't uh, laugh at it, but they buy pancake batter and toilet paper and a million other things that you might not think that they need, but you know they have to feed all the soldiers. So you'd be surprised what they buy. So if you have something that could possibly be sold to the government, Go to a free procurement technical assistance center uh, in Chicago Lander, Illinois. Um, and then uh, who will be in charge of inventory and inventory control measures? Like I said, if you have a POS, that sort of takes care of inventory. And will you have loss prevention policies in place? A lot of people who work in retail, they carry a plastic like purse thing so because some guard checks them in and out every day to show that all they have in there is their lipstick and their phone and their wallet and they're not stealing any jewelry or other things from the store so loss prevention policies 
And then choosing the correct type of um, entity. You know, if you are in a partnership, use a partnership agreement when the when the honeymoon is on and you're in love with the, your partner and always put in there a third party arbitrator so that if you are 50-50 partners and you can't decide should you expand or not expand, a third party independent arbitrator will decide what's best for the business. Always have a buy-sell agreement in there so that you know up front how you're going to buy each other out. Because sometimes, you know, you love your partner. You've known him since you're in kindergarten. He's like a blood brother or sister to you. But you don't like their spouse. They weren't married when you started the business. Now they're married. You want to know up front how you're going to dissolve the business so that if he gets hit by a truck, you know how you can buy out the spouse. So, and sometimes it's not even, you know, that grim. It's just that you have a spouse who, you know, you're selling carpets and you have a great business with your partner, but your partner is married to a doctor. The doctor has an opportunity to be a doctor at Mayo Clinic. So they're going to leave Chicago. So that's why you want to buy sell agreement in place. You need to know what insurances you need. Everybody needs general liability if you have a storefront, if anybody comes to you. And then uh, workman's comp when you hire your first real employee. Errors and omissions is a special type of insurance if you're an architect or a, a builder or an attorney or an accountant. And key employee uh, insurance is insurance that if you are if you have a partner and you are Mr. or Miss Insight, but they do all the selling, you might have key employee insurance on them because if they get hit by a truck, even if they're going to recover for nine weeks, you want to be able to have insurance that says I can hire another salesperson for the nine weeks. They also pay out, God forbid, if the key employee is deceased. Um, and also a big mistake is underestimating, underestimating startup costs. It usually takes twice as much money and at least twice as much time. So I'm just telling you that, and that's minimum. Uh, have you prepared a break-even analysis? I have given Geraldine a template. It is in Excel. And break-even is where total cost equals total revenue. And have you estimated your initial, and that's no profit. You're just, you're not bleeding cash. Every money penny that you're taking in is going towards an expense, but you're not losing money. That's break even. And have you estimated your first year of sales? And then have you done a must monthly cash flow? I have given Geraldine the break even analysis. It has all the Excel equations in place and the cash flow analysis. And it has all the cash, the equations in place. When you download them, save it as the master. When you attempt to do your first break, even in your first cash flow, call it cash flow one or cash flow A, so that you're not changing the original download. So that if you make a mistake, because sometimes when you're doing cash flow, you erase a, a little um, section and you don't know and you accidentally erase the formula. So this way, in the master, you'd always know what the formula was, and you could just copy it and put it back in the cell. How much um, will your business have seasonality? All businesses have seasonality, so know what yours is. It's The um, landscaping actually has five seasons. Some are grass, fall, leaves, winter, snow removal, uh, spring planting, and the fifth season is winter decoration. <clears throat> so decorating for the holiday season and then taking it off come January. So, but but candy has, I'm just going to take a sip of something. <clears throat> Summer allergies. Um, candy has huge seasonality. The big candy makers <clears throat> make candy all summer long. So by August 1st, they can start shipping it to the store so that right, you ever notice right before Labor Day or right after Labor Day, everything is Halloween in every retail store. That's because they made that candy starting in the spring. So it's ready to ship by uh, August 1st. Um, electronics have um, seasonality. 
because people buy it as gifts, you know, at certain times of year, Christmas time, graduation time, Mother's Day, Father's Day. Um, TVs have uh, seasonality because a lot of people buy them in March when they get their tax refunds back or before the big games, you know, when the fall starts and everybody's watching football. Swimsuits obviously have seasonality, but there's a second season. You know, in Chicago, it would be spring for summer swimsuits, but then some stores also have a season, the upper scale stores for those people who go away for the winter. So think about seasonality. And then what are your personal financial and monthly expenses? Do you know how much it's going to cost you to live every month? Do you have a nest egg or a working spouse? Does your spouse have insurance? How much money can you invest? Is there financial support from other family members? But I do not recommend a friends and family round of fundraising because it can make for the worst Thanksgiving ever. Your family member hates you and you have no friends. So don't do it if you can avoid it. Do you have collateral for a traditional loan? By the way, there is crowdfunding going back. You can use um, Kickstarter or Indiegogo or there's even legal um, crowdfunding through selling um, shares up to 5 million in Illinois, but it's called equity crowdfunding and you have to Google it to find out who does it in Chicago, in Illinois. Uh, what are your, um, and then do you have collateral? Do you, can you get financing terms from your vendors? If you buy raw materials from your vendors, can you pay them instead of in 30 days? Can you pay them in 45 or 60? This way you have the time to make the products and sell them before the bill for the raw materials is due. Can you get a co-signer for a loan? You might need one, you might not. Um, and do you know your real credit score? And this is to get a real free credit report. It is not scored, but so many credit cards numbers now give you a credit score. Discover, Chase, um, Bank of America, they are almost all the city, they all have credit scores attached to their credit cards now, specific types of credit cards. So it might be the Chase Slate or the Chase Freedom, but not other Chase ones. So you have to know what you're looking at. This number, the free annual report, gives you one free credit score um, a year. So I recommend you do Equifax, then four months later you do um, uh, TransUnion, and four months later you do Experian. But these are unscored. You have to, pay, if you do it from the or the service itself, you have to pay for the credit score, unless you're over sixty-five, I think. And then um, include smart goals, one-year goals and three-year goals, things, SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-related about your uh, market share, your profitability, your number of customers, your number of repeat customers, you know, you have specific measured goals. And this is, I wanted to finish on time. I'm a few minutes late, but we still have time for questions. Um, and this is how to write me if you have questions. It's been a pleasure. Geraldine, are you there? Geraldine. I am here. I was muted. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> um, okay, let's look for some questions. If yes, you have I any questions, can chair. you please put them in the chat? Um, what are the links that I could download? Okay. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email to anyone who's on this webinar with all the handouts that Donna mentioned. Yeah. The webinar was also recorded and will be posted on BACP's YouTube page. I've also put that in the chat, but it's youtube.com slash Chicago BACP. Give everyone some time to get their yeah. questions in. And, and also, Geraldine, you send out all these handouts, correct? Yes. 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 Okay. I will send a follow up email with all the handouts. As I mentioned them during the lecture. Yes, definitely. 
And then the webinar is recorded as well. If there's any questions. And in the oh, email, if you do write me, please say, you know, heard your um, biz plan lecture. So I know. <laughs> Getting a lot of very useful information. Thank you. Let's see if there's any questions, if you could please put them in the chat, we'll give you another minute. Here's a question. So in a nutshell, can you give us the top five things that go into a business plan? Well, yeah, they were at the very beginning. It's the executive summary, which you write last. Okay. And it's, um, hold on, because it's it's there. It's one of, it's the executive summary. It's the business description. It's the product or service description. So the business description is the name of my business is Rock and Enterprises. It's a subchapter S um, corporation. It's located in the city of Chicago. I'm not going to give out my home address, but I live in a high rise, so it wouldn't matter anyway. And um, my product or service description I am a full service consultant to small businesses uh, who start up product or service related businesses. I specialize in helping clients access financing. My marketing plan is, I've you know described it as small business startups. So that's the specific set. You know, I'm not going to be a consultant to craft or, or uh, Nestle's or uh, General Mills, but to small businesses, hey, I'm your woman. Uh, my operations and management plan, I have an accountant to do taxes. I have a lawyer, a small business attorney for legal advice. And I do my own bookkeeping, but I have a graduate degree and took enough accounting. I'm qualified to do it. And my financial plan, well, I would share it with the banker, but I wouldn't share it with all of you, although I'm thrilled that you all dialed in today. Okay, great. Another question. I need to know how to do a one-page business plan. Can you give some yes. advice on just doing a one-pager? Yes. If you want, do that thing that I first mentioned, the business model generation and I have given Geraldyn the handout for this and get the book and you can get it from it's by strategizer is the name of the company the business model generation but also you can save the one I sent Geraldyn as the master and they tell you in the business model generation booklet use sticky notes first to write stuff down it, it has nine segments in it and the segments are key partners, key activities, key resources, value proposition, customer relations, channels, customer segments, cost structure, and revenue streams. And it will help you organize your thoughts. And they tell you to put the things on sticky notes so that if you decide, oh, it's really not a key activity, it really is a um, you know resource or it's a channel of distribution. So it's called the Business Model Canvas. It was created by the author Alec, Alexander Osterwalder and the name of the company it's published under is Strategizer. It's his company. So uh, that, but no banker will take you seriously on it, but it will help organize your thoughts before you even write the business plan. Great, thank you. When writing up the one-year finances, how independent do I need to be? I'm not sure I understand. Well, what it does is I think it even has the startup um, expenses. In oh, I think he meant in, how in-depth. How Oh, very. And that's why you should use the template that I gave Geraldine, because it has a lot of things that you'll forget, like bank fees and phone fees. Um, but you can also add categories to it. But it has things like insurance and internet and web charges, postage and delivery, professional fees, repairs and maintenance, rent or lease, supplies, taxes, licenses, telephone, transportation, utilities. You know, it has all the money coming in and the money going out. So, you know, if you have five salespeople, you don't have to, you can use the aggregate of how much they're selling every month. You don't have to say, Bill's selling 10%. Susan's a better salesperson. She's done it longer. She sells 20%, you know, 
but it's it's a very detailed cash flow plan and I recommend you use it. Just use the categories that are in there. Any bank will respect it. Great, thank you. I'm looking, I'll give everyone another minute or two to write their questions. Lots of thank yous coming in. My pleasure. All right, Donna, that looks like that is, uh, thank you All for your right. time and information. <laughs> My pleasure. And thank you, Donna. Is in and out on time. Thank yes. you very much. It's been a pleasure. Take care, everyone. Have a yes, good thank you, Donna. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I will send out those, uh, the email with all the information that Donna provided. And I'm wishing everyone a great and safe, happy weekend. Thank you, everyone.